Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this morning, which is John Blaine. I think you're all aware we're here at the U3A meeting in um, Hermanus. So John Blaine is a, a very experienced geologist. He's a UCT graduate. He then, after his graduation, became effectively an exploration geologist, and he worked in that field for most of his career. He had a long and very um, successful period with Falconbridge in base metal exploration, worked in the Northern Cape, and then did some excellent work in the um, Central Kalahari Game Reserve with a group of his colleagues um, exploring for diamonds. And they had a number of successes there. Unfortunately, they never found a big mine, but they certainly showed what could be done using geophysics, mostly aromatic, to, to discover kimberlites. Subsequently, John, like many of us, uh, made, a, made a transition, I think, around his retirement from Falconbridge into the junior exploration and mining sector and has worked on a number of commodities during that period of his life. Subsequently, he retired down here to the Manus, and he's one of our very active Overberg Geological Group scientists and helping us raise the profile of geology in the Overberg and take geology to the layperson, scholars, um, kids, etc. And today, John's going to talk about the geology of the Himalanada Valley, which is one of our fun projects um, working with the, the wine farmers or the wine farms and the wine makers up the valley. And that's the subject of this talk today. So I will hand over to John. Thank you. Thanks, John. And good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you're able to attend to this morning and a really nice turnout. This view uh, southwest down the Himalanada Valley is really familiar to, to just about all of us. And it's quite distinctive with the, the peak of Babylon's Tour in there at 1167 meters, slightly higher than Table Mountain. But on here, you'll see on this slope here, which is south facing, are predominantly berry farms. And then on the, on the, predominantly on the north facing slope here, are predominantly the white farms. And that's one of the characteristics of this valley that vines grow in different places for different reasons. A short introduction, followed by just a comment on the traditional terroir components. We'll talk about the geology in the, in the Amanus area. We look at individual terroirs at Hamilton Russell, at Spurfontaine, and an unusual location in the valley. A comment on the, the wine growing in, or the vine growing in environment, and maybe a new definition or a new arrangement of the, ter the elements of terroir, and a conclusion. Um, just an introduction, the, the Oberberg Geoscientist Group, we really started a project to better understand how the underlying geology, and in this case, the Cape Granite, Table Mountain Sandstones, Bok Krol Shales, and the Deary Crust from ancient land surfaces, including our friend Coffee Clip, as well as younger colluvium, alluvium, and their soil and clay components affect the vines and wines. To date, we've interacted with three well-known wine farms and a mixed farming venture in all three parts of the valley, and we'll progressively interact with other farms and winemakers to establish an overview of the relationship between geology, soils, and terroir and hopefully add another layer to geoheritage and geoeducation in the wine, tourism, enjoyment and experience. At the same time, we're engaging with a pre-primary and a primary high school in the Valley to try and develop and expose and educate learners, educators and laypersons about the rocks, minerals, geology, water and their critical role in underpinning our environment. The image in the top right is the pre-primary school at Hamilton Russell which is a delightful establishment. And further up the valley beyond creation, there's the Pebbles School, which is a primary and high school, supporting the, the children of workers in the valley. The bottom right is, is a picture of the uh, Transpire Earth Age display, which was developed by Mike Dormer, one of our members, and provides a lovely introduction to an understanding of the background geology in our environment. So terroir, when referring to wine, is a mystical term, mostly designed, I believe, to confuse the interested wine consumer. And most commonly, I find winemakers concerned with climate, which is uh, the angle of the sun, the rainfall, temperature, wind and sea breeze, the soils, that's the, the water, hydrology, water in the soils, to pedology, top and subsoil, which talks about the depth, the texture, granulometry, induration, mineralogy, clay content, chemistry, 
and then geomorphology, which is the, the elevation, aspect, aptitude, and slope. That's the shape of the land. The underlying rocks tend to be ignored in many respects or referred to very generally as shale, granite, or sandstone. And alluvial deposits can be referred to as alluvium or cobbles. And then there's also a coffee cup. However, in reality, all aspects of geology come into play and provide the foundation on which our vines are grown and from which South Africa's excellent wines are made in different parts of the Western Cape and further afield. Geology as such, which is the origin of the topography, cycles of rock formation, continental drift, location of continents and ocean basins, mountain building and macroclimate are rather forgotten in the traditional sense of terroir. In this complexity, though, one could become more confusing for the layperson, so we will revert to the winemaker's vocabulary and stick to shale, granite, sandstone, and coffee clay. In the Himalaya wine valley north of Amanus, all these features are in play, but few of the winemakers, according to their websites, would really address this geology. And my personal experience is the same in the Stettin Valley and around Worcester recently, that they talk all about the soil, but really don't know anything about the the rocks and the geology. So just to go back in time a little bit, when you talk about geology, it covers an enormous amount of time. And uh, you've heard of us talking of this uh, magical 4.6 billion years, which we're now trying to represent in these rock gardens with this 46-meter uh, rope or something similar. But where do we fit in this uh, scheme of events? The life clock on the right shows the whole circle of life a whole circle of Earth's existence in, in the 24-hour clock, and humans appeared right there in the very last few seconds of that clock. And uh, it doesn't matter how long we're on this planet, we're not going to change that time frame very much. In terms of Amanus and where it locates in the geology, all our rocks are actually quite low down in, in the sequence, which are the, in the, uh, between about 540 and about 400 million years ago in the Cape Supergroup. Then all of those that formed tip on their sides. The Amanus Terrace was, was planed by the ocean at a previous high stand uh, during the Pleistocene and at about one and a half million years ago. And uh, excuse these latecomers. And uh, and then eventually, finally, the wine farms operate really in the very top part of the weathered profile, which and weathering can occur over all of those rocks and give rise to different products. A uh, little summary of where what, where and what this Cape Supergroup is. This is where the Cape Supergroup formed in the Agulhas Sea between 340 and 500 million years ago, in a in a broad, slowly rifting trough, which of, across the southern part of the Gondwana supercontinent, uh, which covered uh, South America, Africa, parts of Antarctica, and the Falklands, Falklands Plateau. And there are remnants of these rocks found in those areas today. Finally, after periods of extended rifting, the deposition of the, of the full Cape Supergroup, the Table Mountain, uh, Table Mountain Group, the Brookfeld Group, and the Witwer Group, things started closing up again, and deformation occurred. And today, we have a, a highly deformed and very complex uh, arrangement of rocks. So that's a sequence you're probably all very familiar with the, the coastline to the south. This is a section through uh, the Otaniquas, the Cedarburg, and then through Meringsport to Prince Albert and into the Karoo. So that's what it looks like in section. Get back to our local environment. Um, the Himalayan, this is a, a summary geological map of, the, of, the, of Walker Bay and the surroundings. Uh, Walker Bay is this uh, extensive uh, downfaulted uh, centenorium of Bockerfeld rocks, shales, and, and sand, sandstones, and saltstones, mudstones, um, between two major faults, one just south of Amanus and one just north of Hans Bay. In amongst this uh, are upfaulted blocks of the Cape Granite, which is the lower, which underlies all of the Cape Supergroup. So they're the oldest rocks. They've now been brought up to the surface uh, here in the Himalayan Valley, just uh, north of Stanford at the base of the Clanrefere Mountains, and then to the east of Conspire in these wedges as a result of, of block faulting during separation of, of, uh, 
breakup of the Gondwana continent. And many of these are repetitions of early faults that were formed during the Cape Fold Belt. So the area we're gonna focus on is outlined in red there in that, uh, in that oval. So the summary of the geology here in the valley, we have the Cape Granites as I've referred to. These intrude the, the Malmesbury group sediments, um, which are not exposed here around in the Overberg, except further to the east, but very clearly uh, exposed along Clarence Drive, uh, which many of you might have seen around Blostian and, uh, and uh, Coolby. That was, uh, that, was, uh, penny, that was all deformed and eroded um, and penny planed about 500 million years ago. And many of you have probably seen that unconformable contact along Chapman's Peak Drive, where you have the granite with a flat surface with the, with the sandstone on top, followed by the Table Mountain Group, which includes the, the Table Mountain sandstone proper called the, uh, called the Peninsula Formation, the, uh, the Puckace uh, Glacial Horizon, the, the Cedarberg Shale, and then followed by two further sandstone groups, the, uh, the Cardini and the Skrovaberg. Overlain by Bockefeld group shales and mudstones, um, and minor sandstone, fine grained sandstones. And then in the valley here, we then have the weathering products on top of all of those rocks, um, which are combined clay, are made up by clay, soils, and ferrycrete, and the vines on the top. So it's a very simplified section. So this is a, a Google view of the valley. Uh, just to outline here, this is. This is the road up the valley, runs through there. The Onrus Rafia runs down like that. Um, Hamilton Russell's in the, in the Hilman Arda Valley proper. Bookfontein is in the upper Hilman Arda and Creation and Dipkata in the Hilman Arda Ridge. This wedge here is, is the uh, Hermanus granite, the Hermanus pluton as it's called, uh, which conform, unconformably underlies this uh, bulk of the Babylon's Turin Mountains um, in, a, in, a, in a, a sedimentary contact or nonconformity. Everywhere else, it's bounded by faults, which have upthrown the granite, in this case, all the way up in contact with the Table Mountain Group sandstones. Here, in contact with, uh, with the Bockefeld Shale, is, is thrown, down thrown in contact with the, the underlying Table Mountain Group. So we're looking at at movements here of the order of many thousands of meters. And uh, I don't think any of us really understand the time frame in which these take place, but I suppose it's in the same time frame as it took for Gondwana to separate. These things were separating, subsiding, lifting up, and changing. So the, the three farms then are Hamilton Russell down here in, in the bottom, in the Himalayan Arda, uh, the, the original, the traditional Himalayan Arda, Bookfontein, which is here in the, uh, um, uh, in, in the, in the upper Himalayan Arda and creation. And basically, Hamilton Russell is in the, in the Bockefeld Shales. Spookfontein is on granite. And creation is also on Bockefeld Shales. The other feature here is, in fact, uh, Hermanus. You all know about the, the water supply for Hermanus, the groundwater supply. Well, this is the Hermanus Fault. It runs through at the base of the Ulifonsberg Mountain here and runs all the way up, joins up here. There's a complex system of inter intersecting faults here. And you may have seen Mboto's presentation some months ago on this, which is fascinating. So a schematic cross-section through the, the valley. You've got the, the coastal hills to the south here different block faulting arrangements with granite thrown up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, table mountain sandstone down thrown and then weathering of all of that to give you the wine growing environment in this area. So the different rock types, Cape granite. Well, a, a, gra a granite is an igneous rock that's formed in fire, uh, is intrusive <coughs> and is the foundation of practically all of the Overberg region. It occurs in upfaulted blocks and directly underlies dominant sandstone mountains in the Table Mountain Group. It's coarse grained, that is, uh, with a grade sizes of one to 10 millimeters, and comprises felspar, which, which is made up of silicon, aluminium, potassium, 
or sodium. It's a vitreous white cream colored blocky crystal and quartz, which is silicon and a clear glassy and generally irregular shaped crystals. Then there would be lesser amounts of biotype mica, which also made up of silicon, potassium, magnesium, iron, and aluminium, which forms dark black or brown sheets. And occasionally in the Cape Granite, you find cordyrite, which is actually a metamorphic mineral, which has been incorporated from the monetary group. All of, the Cape Granite weathers easily in the humid environments, forms clays and sand, clay from commonly kaolinite, from, particularly from weathering of the feldspar. It's white or cream colored and sticky, very sticky, as you may know it, and uh, is used for making pottery. Um, and has uh, a lot of suitable nutrition for vine growth from the, from the elements that were in the original uh, mineral. The sand that forms is predominantly caught with uh, larger granite fab fra fragments which concentrate on surface and forms a well-drained soil. That's a sample of, of probably one of the few bits of granite we've been able to find in this valley, uh, courtesy of uh, where they were excavating at, at Cap Maritime. But this, uh, this round boulder is now on the entrance stairway to Creation Wine Farm. And there you can see the blocky feldspar, um, the irregular quartz grains, and the darker biotite mica. There's an example of the weathered granite in that Cap Maritime vineyard opposite the uh, Hasha or Simmer Ridge, as it was. This is a very weathered, sticky and wet, uh, deeply weathered, clay rich. Uh, 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 sorry, kaolinite rich granite, overlined by the sandy humic soil. And the humus uh, is most likely derived from, from uh, decomposition of all the feinbos on top. And this uh, stone and, and cobble horizon is very common in African landscapes um, mm -hmm. and, and really relates to a much earlier weathering environment and it's preserved in these profiles. So the Table Mountain group, sandstones, this uh, sedimentary rock, which was deposited in water. And, this, and in this case, uh, predominantly made up of quartz grains and occasionally scattered quartz pebbles, a few little uh, uh, gravel, uh, quartz pebble gravel horizons, and is predominantly silica dioxide. So pretty benign from an, from an elemental point of view. It was deposited in layers in a slowly deepening seafloor and is characterized by cross bedding, which is formed by currents on the sea floor, forming large scale ripples. And very similar to, to what is seen on the, on the seabed in Walker Bay at present. Although the sands that are washing into Walker Bay are much finer grained and have a large component of shelly material. Derived, this, these uh, sandstones be derived from erosion of a hinterland, which is way north of us in the, the uh, the core of, of Southern Africa, um, there, where there were much older granites and gneisses and uh, older quartzite units and the slow erosion of these rocks um, into the basin from the sandstones. And the interesting thing about these sandstones is they, they are very clean. You have to consider back in those times, there were no vegetation. Uh, rivers were very fast flowing and the, uh, the products of weathering of those, those hinterland rocks could be, could be easily winnowed out. The fine material was washed away to deeper parts of the basin and the sands were very clean and were rewashed uh, time and again. So, so this weathering of, of this table mountain group forms boulders and sandy slopes at the base of these higher mountains and uh, they form well-drained soils, but they lack nutri suitable nutrition for vine growth. And that's quite an important uh, 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 comparison between that and the uh, granite and then the, 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 uh, the Blockerfeld. Mm -hmm. You've all seen the, uh, the sandstones outcropping along the Hermanus cliff path, where you can see numerous examples of planar bedding, cross bedding, curved bedding, cross cutting structures. There's evidence of, of, struct, of thrust faulting and normal faulting and many, many cracks and joints and, and vein structures within those rocks. And that's another interesting walk if anybody uh, would like to take that sometime. So the Bockerfeld is also a sedimentary rock characterized by a cyclic alteration of mudstone and fine-grained sandstone that when subjected, subjected to pressure by burial and, uh, and compression 
uh, will form shale. So it becomes more of a flaky, a flaky rock. Composed of quartz and phyllosilicate minerals, which are platy, flaky, flaky micas and chlorides, and chemically predominantly silicon, aluminium, and iron. Derived also from weathering of granites and gneisses, and being finer grain, these minerals were deposited further out in the deepening ocean basin. Uh, weathering of, the, of these Bockefeld rocks uh, falls by oxidation of the micas and clays to form an iron rich rock. Uh, uh, form iron-rich rocks, which are not predominantly exposed, as they are much softer than the Table Mountain Group sandstone, but they do provide suitable nutrition for vine growth because of all the elements they contain. They do, however, lack good drainage, but have good water retention characteristics. This is an example of, of these uh, weathered mudstones up the, the R320, just past creation. There's a lovely road cutting there. And particularly if it's been raining, it's washed clean and you get these beautiful banded colors, which is very characteristic of the Bockefeld uh, mudstones before they've actually been compressed and become shaped. So that's, a, that's a, a useful, interesting outcrop. Another example is here on the R43 opposite Benguela Cove. We get these uh, rather spectacularly white, white weathered Bockefeld mudstones. Um, with a lot of iron enriched layers in them. And then on top here, you'll note this coffee clip gravel. Now that coffee clip gravel is quite a characteristic of many areas around the valley and even up in, in the Botrafia Valley. And uh, I think there's a whole story related to that as well. And we'll come to that. So the fairy creates, if you don't know, is an iron rich dewy crust. It means it falls by weathering of previous surfaces and during is like enduring. It it's a hardened layer on or in the soil. The particles are soil particles cemented by iron oxides, which are precipitated from groundwater to form this erosion resistant layer. Um, often the soil, soil covering that is eroded from the surface and it, which is exposed at, as a rock surface. And parts of this old ferricrete layer may remain as remnants on this old erosion surface. Along the Southern Cape coastal belt, fairy Crete and Silk Crete, which is a silica rich version of the same thing, are remnants of the African erosion surface dated at the early mid tertiary between 65 and 30 million years ago. So this is at the time post Gondwana separation when the inland was lifting up, coastal belt was, was uh, stable and a long period of erosion occurred. That's throughout the Southern African continent, the African erosion surface. These remnants extend east from Riversdale towards Bredasdorp and the eroded gravels now form part of the soil profile in the Gilnanada Valley. There are two remnant hilltops uh, which occur on dip cut in the Gilnanada Ridge. And this ferry creek form also forms a lot from groundwater directly along the fault at uh, Spokfontein, one farm. Here at uh, Deep Cut, there's the nod nodular ferry crete on the left, very hard, lumpy rock. These are, these are uh, sort of piezolytic iron ore balls. Um, you can see the capping it forms there uh, on that farm is about 250 meters elevation, and there's a very hard, massive ferry crete which forms that. And the, those, uh, that layer would correlate way off to the east to the first the other layers you see uh, east of, of Swellendam. Here's another example of coffee clip. This is in a, in a, a road cutting uh, past creation there. You get a very well developed degraded fairy creek. This is sort of cobbles and gravel of, of fairy creek fragments forming this gravelly soil which, which uh, very strangely enough lies on a very sharp contact with the underlying deeply wetted Bockefell, which is a it's a in my mind, a very um, striking feature, and I, I have no explanation for it at all, which would, would seem to indicate that there was a, 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 a period of rapid erosion of that Bockefeld that cleaned the developing soil off it, and then this gravel then reformed, being washed in or degrading from being overlying all these rocks, breaking down. In uh, one of the vineyard preparation areas at creation, here you can see quite clearly this, uh, um, this degraded gravelly ferry creep with the humic soil. Now in many of these sections, these, these uh, uh, 
these farms, these, these uh, fields have been uh, plowed and, and cultivated before. So this becomes mixed already, but still there you can see this top portion, which is quite distinct from the deeply weathered Bockefeld shale and mudstone below. Let's go down now to, to the Himmel and Arda Valley proper, uh, Hamilton Russell Vineyard, who hosted uh, some of our activities. This is uh, an aerial view, it's a bleak aerial view, Hamilton Russell, which lies here on Bockefeld rocks. And very distinctly, the contact between the Bockefeld um, uh, shales and mudstones and the underlying Table Mountain Group sandstones is really defined by the top of the vineyards. That makes a lot of sense. Um, on the other side here, this is the Amanus Fault, which forms along that escarpment. You have the, this is the Ferntruhe Fault that runs up there. And here's the fault that, that down throws the Bockefeld Group uh, against the Table Mountain Group to the north. So in this block here, which is called the Roselle block, there was a new planting of Pinot Noir, and they systematically excavated one meter deep pits uh, to do their chemical sampling so they could determine what has to be added to the soil from that. Very, very detailed chemical analyses, um, which uh, they just you know, follow by rote, and they, they send that to Vinpro, and Vinpro says you should add these things to the soil, and, and so they do. And largely it's, it's calcium because these are very calcium poor rocks. Um, in fact, there are very few calcium rich uh, bedrocks on which vines grow in, in the Western Cape, mainly up in the Robertson Valley. And, uh, and also phosphorus, which is an essential nutrient which is, is uh, missing from it. So in one of the profiles here, uh, we have this uh, 36 to 60 centimeter uh, thick top layer, the degraded ferricrete gravel, which has got coffee clip in it, mixed with a sandy loam soil and organic, organic from previous plantings. Um, you have this no nutrition and moisture layer down to about 120 centimeters, where you get extensive root penetration. And even in this excavated area where there were previous vines, you could still see the remnants of thin roots. And at creation, where they also excavated for a shed, Right next to a vineyard, we could follow the, the thin tendrils of roots down to nearly two meters into the weathered Bockefeld Shale. And then below that, you have the level of groundwater and cracks and fractures, which is the bedrock Bockefeld Shale. And there's moisture in those rocks for many meters. We, uh, John and I compiled these, uh, these two uh, glass columns, uh, particularly for, their, for their, their Pinot Noir celebration at the end of January which summarizes, in fact, doesn't show it, it shows it more clearly what, the, what the, the various layers are. You've got the, the coffee clip gravel on top, and then this mixed uh, sandy loam with organics below that, and then the nutrition and moisture layer, where you get root penetration into the saprolytic weathered rock, and below that, the, these fragments of, of Bockefeld shale, which, uh, in fact, we had to excavate up a deep cut, just represent the type of, uh, of more fresh rock, but fractured, uh, which lies below. At Sportfontein, this is a, 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 another satellite image. Here's the R320. Here's a, the, the fault which separates granite on this side and the, the Table Mountain Group sandstone on this side. So there's, there's many thousands of meters of throw here. So this is the entire Table Mountain Group, which has been down thrown here, or the granite up thrown, to, to produce this contact. Just, just below the, uh, the Sportfontein uh, tasting room and restaurant, there's, a, there's, a, there's water seeps out along this fault, all the way along here. And in this area, which is the Pinot Noir block, is characterized by a lot of fairy creek. At the entrance here by the forest, you'll, find, you'll see a big rounded boulder, which I'll show you. And then on the, on the road here, massive uh, ferricrete cemented sandstone. But the, the entire, the soil profile in this block is made up of ferricrete fragments. So this is the, uh, the, the unusual round, this uh, ferricrete cemented conglomerate, which uh, lies in a very prominent boulder, just as you drive past the forest into, uh, 
into Spokfontein. It's 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 un, it's unusual in that I say because it combines rounded pebbles of very grain size, unsorted fragments, a fine sandy matrix, and is rather a, an unusual rock in this location. If it wasn't cemented, it would look like a, a boulder terrace. And I'll show you shortly something similar. But this is high up above the Onrush River and may indicate a previous level of the Onrush River, which has subsequently been cemented by iron rich waters seeping out of that fault. In this uh, Pinot Noir block, you have this massive ferry creek uh, on the left here. It's a, it's a sandstone, and it's actually ferry creek cemented sandstone from the sand eroded, it seems to be, from weathering out of the Table Mountain sandstone above that. And then in the, in the vineyard itself, you have this really coarse ferry creek breccia and gravel, which forms the so-called soil in which these vines grow. So their roots go down, in fact, into granite into the weathered granite below this. So this is all the rubble on the surface. And that seems to be quite an important characteristic in all these things, that the vines grow in a very gravelly surface that is well-drained, but they like to get their roots down and they're very good at getting their roots down into a substrate that provides nutrition and moisture. Back down in the Himalada Valley, we have on the, in that road cutting opposite Barto Exti, and you have this rather you have this remnant of uh, this abandoned channel, which must have been the, the, the previous level of the Onrush River. Uh, it's about 30 meters above the present channel. And here you can see the underlying um, fine grained sandstone and shale of the Bockefeld dipping in this direction. It's very weathered and an unconformable contact here with these uh, sandstone conglomerate boulders and sand and more sandy sand and pebbles above that. And above that, uh, this ubiquitous degraded ferry creek gravel. The local vines there grow in this well grain, uh, pebbly gravel and sand derived from that paleo channel, which gives them the same thing. They're able to, to grow in something which is well drained, get the roots down to something where there's moisture and nutrition. So, in the bulk compositions of, of basically mainly the Cape Granite and the Bockerfeld, in the granite, you've got uh, quartz, feldspar, and a combination of, of these minerals, uh, biotite and cordurite. And those provide uh, the, some of the uh, basic ingredients uh, on, on which the vines can grow to get the nutrition. And these minerals are present in the Cape Granite and most granites and contribute elements to the soil during the weathering process. Now, the Bockefeld group rocks are also derived from erosion of pre existing rocks, older granites. And they're important source rock and contribute similar key elements to the soils derived therefrom. The clay minerals that develop during the wetting process cause very different soil textures and they have water and nutrient retention properties. Weathering of the sandstone contribute largely to textural variability as sands and gravels and provide permeability to the soil. And the Ferry Creek gravel provides that added layer of permeability on the surface. And I think that there is a there is a, 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 a complementary amount of, of of addition to Pinot Noirs that provides that that iron must might provide, but that's not true of all the Pinot Noirs as we'll come to see. So traditionally, winemakers have these uh, these four things, starting with the climate and then soils and the geomorphology. Uh, theoretically, it should go climate, geomorphology, soils. And then geology is of least interest. To right, so uh, we come to what, how we, we would prefer to review terroir, another view. The contemporary uh, wine geo enthusiast or geo wine enthusiast would prefer to put geology at, at the top of the list. When you come into an area, you, the geology is in your face, and uh, you always tend to want to interpret that. The geomorphology with the elevation aspect, altitude and slope will, will tell you something about what happened to the rocks after they'd been uh, laid down. And then the soils and how those have changed will help to give some indication of, of what sort of crops should grow or would be growing in that area. The climate to then is probably of least interest to geologists. Now, in January 2022, there was the Pinot Noir celebration in, in the Himalaya Valley, and this uh, French fellow, Jean Vincent Rodin, 
uh, wrote an article and he said, are there Hebel and Art Awards on their way to becoming the first true Appalachians in South Africa? And uh, Appalachian is, is quite a big deal in Europe. And I don't know that it's much applied in South Africa. We tend to refer to wards, which are small uh, patches of wine growing area. And he summarized the first five columns of these of, in the three areas, the Himal and Arda. He gave the, the distance from the sea and the altitude and the north facing aspect. And those are the estates that are involved. And he noted that they grow on thin, poor clay soils on the lower slopes. In the Hillman, upper Hillman and Arda, slightly further inland, slightly higher elevation, they, they uh, face north and south. We have a number of the different wineries in that area, and that's, they're all on weathered granite sands over clay. Uh, the Hillman and Arda Ridge is even further in at somewhat similar ele elevation, slightly higher on average. Um, they, they face south and east, and there you have a number of well known wineries, and they, they predominantly grow on deeper. Uh, table Mountain Group derived sands and clay rich uh, Bockerfeld shales. So, though, so we stick the bedrock in the end there, we can clearly define that the upper one, the thin poor clay are on Bockerfeld shale and mudstone, weathered grain, granite is self explanatory, and then the, the deeper sands and clays are from Bockerfeld and Table Mountain Group sandstone. So, his summary was that these Pinot Noirs are world class expressions of very unique terroirs, at the same time global in quality, truly local and very proudly South African. But he, although he, thought he could clearly identify, and he could identify in a blind taste, the, ba the, the, the bedrock, the soil in which it, it was derived. And he clearly stated that, and he felt that that was going to be the, the defining feature of the Appalachian. So the wards, the different, it's just fortuitous that it's been geographically derived into Himalayan Valley, Upper Himalayan Valley, and Himalayan Ridge, but they actually define three different uh, terroirs as might be defined in an Appalachian. So our conclusion then is that additional geological information can add a further geotourism dimension to the whole wine experience. Particularly there's Hamilton Russell uh, vineyards, uh, Anthony Hamilton Russell and Johan Montgomery, who were very helpful and and really got us uh, thinking a lot and, and compiling these sections. Sportfontein wines, near this Ace the winemaker, they were very helpful. He even excavated that, that pit there in, in the Ferry Creek uh, so we could see the section. Carolyn and JP Martin, a creation that we really were probably the early drivers for us to, to tell them something about uh, their soils and uh, their wine growing environment in that area. And then Dipcott Farm with Peter and James Davison, they were fascinated and very interested to show us around the various features in that area, which have got a lovely exposure of a relatively fresh Bockerfeld shale and these uh, very interesting Ferry Crete cappings on top of the hill there. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah, this is a question about how do they decide on which wines to plant in different soils. That's a science on its own. And you may know that there's a very important uh, support structure for the wine industry called VINPRO. And I guess the Enological Institute, Stellenbosch there, provide all the source rootstock for vines. And the vines, uh, as I've learned to, to understand, they're very much like deciduous fruit. You have a good, strong rootstock, and then you can add to it whatever vines you want, whatever variety you want. So I, I believe there is a, a core rootstock for different varietals, but you can vary the, the final product on what you graft on. You know, and as you know, it's, it's not a rapid turnaround. You know, a good vineyard will take five to seven years to reach maturity. And I believe it's very similar to, to deciduous fruits. So just to expand on that a bit further, probably the early people probably just started and saw what grew best. The whole industry, like any farming industry, is incredibly complex. No one wine farmer could do all the stuff they need to do without all this huge body of knowledge. I, I believe that there are lots of sharing. The question from Mick is, uh, is the peat in the valley um, related at all to being able to make whiskey? Peat is a, another completely different story, and I think John has got it in his mind for us to, 
to develop a story around that. And there are people actually working on that to preserve that because that's a, that's a very interesting historical artifact of our, of our climatic regime. And uh, it's also very important water retention, natural dam. And as things dry up further downstream, <laughs> there will be water absorbed into that, that peat. I, I've not really myself seen a decent section cut in that. I've seen decent sections cut in peat in Scotland and in Ireland, and it looks very, that stuff is very different, uh, I think. And the water, of course, the amount of water that dr would drain through it would, would probably absorb a lot more of the, the color and the flavor than perhaps this peat here, because it's focused in the river valley. But uh, comes to making whiskey, I don't know, these wine farms, they make gin, so who knows? Thank you.